Good day. My name is Michelle Lavander, and I'm the director of the USC Center for Health Journalism. Thanks for joining us today for our Health Matters webinar, Unequal Health Systems, Anti-Black Racism, and the Threat to American Health. It's been nearly two decades since the publication of a groundbreaking Institute of Medicine report that chronicled sweeping disparities in the quality of health care received by Black and Brown Americans. People of color in this country experience a lower quality of health services and are less likely to receive even routine preventive medical procedures, the report found. Its author, Brian Smedley of the Urban Institute, is here to talk with us today about how little progress has been made in addressing these fundamental divides, as well as opportunities for progress and change. In chronicling the state of affairs in the 2003 Institute of Medicine report, he didn't call out systemic racism, but he's doing so now in a forthcoming book he is co-authoring for Cambridge University Press called Unequal Health, Anti-Block Racism and the Threat to American Health. The challenges go beyond individuals and their intent, delving into structures and systems that as he puts it, have racism baked in from the start. In our conversation today, he'll be sharing insights on the improper use of race, in clinical decision-making and on how widespread policies built around for pay for performance or value-based healthcare can exacerbate disparities. He'll also share insights on how to write with context and nuance about the interplay between heavy disease burden and the disproportionate toll of COVID on communities of color. For the Center for Health Journalism, this wide-ranging Health Matters discussion launches a mini-series about health equity and health systems. You could tweet about this webinar with the hashtag of health equity. Before we get underway with a virtual room filled with so many journalists, I'd like to mention that the Center for Health Journalism is reopening our call for applications for our upcoming California fellowship, which provides training, $2,000 reporting grants and mentoring for journalists with the California Focus project that they've always wanted to tackle, especially if they want some extra help. Our core focus of the California Fellowship Program, like this webinar today, is health equity. And to learn more, you can email us at editor at centerforhealthjournalism.org. We'll also put more information on the program in the chat. Now let's turn to our distinguished guest speaker, Brian Smedley, an equity scholar at the Urban Institute who led the team behind the landmark report, Unequal Treatment, Confronting Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare by the Institute of Medicine. Before joining Urban Institute, he served as the Chief of Psychology in the Public Interest at the American Psychological Association. He was co-founder and executive director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity, a project that connects research, policy, analysis, and communications with on-the-ground activism to advance health equity. He was also co-director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Culture of Health Leaders National Program Center. And before that, Vice President and Director of, health policy, of the Health Policy Institute at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies in Washington, DC, a research and policy organization focused on addressing the needs of communities of color. This webinar is made possible thanks to the generous support of the Commonwealth Fund, the California Endowment, and the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation, as well as individual supporters like you. We'll be archiving this webinar later today at centerforhealthjournalism.org. A word about our format today, we'll be hearing from Brian Smedley first, and then we'll turn it over to our audience for questions. Feel free to share general comments in the chat. Because we have many people joining us on Zoom, we'll ask you to write your questions for our speaker into the Q&A panel. You can also write us there if you're experiencing technical problems. Now let's get underway. Brian, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you to you and the Center for Health Journalism for organizing this series and inviting me. One of the things that I wanna say from the outset is that health equity issues are complex, very difficult to report on, but the Center for Health Journalism has done an amazing job of helping journalists to tackle this complex issue uh, and to help readers understand the importance of this issue for all of us in our everyday lives. Uh, there's a wonderful example of the kind of excellent work that the Center for Health Journalism does uh, in today's issue of STAT uh, with a wonderful article by a USC Center for Health Journalism alum, Usha McFarlane, uh, on the issue of uh, what we're talking about today, 
racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare and whether or not we've made any progress uh, toward reducing and ultimately eliminating those inequities. So my hat's off to you, Michelle, you and your team for the wonderful work that you all do. Uh, and congratulations to all of the journalists that participate in this wonderful program. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. And um, I want to just speak briefly, and then I look forward to having a conversation with all of you about this issue of racism in American health care. Uh, I wanna start out by telling you exactly what I hope to cover. Uh, and I'm offering these cliff notes because uh, if I don't get around to talking about all of these topics, please do raise questions uh, toward the end. I wanna begin by defining what we mean by racism, particularly to talk about examples of structural and institutional forms of racism in healthcare. Uh, it's important that we all have a common understanding of what we mean by these terms and what are some examples of these uh, factors and how they affect uh, the health of people of color as well as all patients in American health systems. I'll discuss progress that we've made toward reducing and ultimately eliminating these healthcare inequities. What we'll learn today is that unfortunately we've not made tremendous progress, uh, but there are some promising areas uh, that I do want to highlight. I'll try to unpack some of the factors that contribute to healthcare inequities. And again, this is a complex issue. Uh, it is certainly not possible to, to uh, offer you a skinny uh, version or a Cliff Notes version uh, of the issues, but I hope to be able to provide a, a broad enough overview uh, to allow us to have a, a meaningful conversation. Then we'll discuss some policy strategies moving forward. Let me just begin by acknowledging the moment that we're in. Dozens of jurisdictions around the country and even our federal centers for disease control and prevention have declared that racism is a public health crisis. I couldn't agree more. Uh, it is clear that racism in many forms is killing people of color and thus has implications for all Americans. That's why uh, I've entitled this talk, The Threat to American Health. Racism is a threat to the health and well-being of all of us. Uh, and I hope to provide examples of this shortly. What's exciting about this time is that we're having this conversation. In our public discourse, we're talking for the first time about systemic racism uh, and the fact that racism is pervasive going beyond uh, the intent of individuals as Michelle indicated at the beginning. But I wonder sometimes if we all understand what we mean by these terms, uh, particularly terms like systemic racism. Well, I've turned to the work of Dr. Kamara Jones, a former uh, president of the American Public Health Association, a noted physician, one of our most distinguished scholars on the topic of health equity, uh, to unpack what we mean by racism. Dr. Jones argues that racism is in itself a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on what we look like. And in particular, making associations with certain phenotypic properties such as skin color and hair texture with what we have come to understand as race in the United States. We know that racism um, structures opportunity and it assigns value based on what we look like. It unfairly disadvantages people of color and low income communities. It unfairly advantages whites and the well-off, but ultimately undermines the full potential of the whole society through the waste of human resources. This is part of the threat to all Americans when some of us uh, are, uh, are left behind and when some of us cannot participate uh, in the political, social, and economic life of this country because of our poor health status that ultimately hurts all of us. It drains our, our human capital, it drains our resources, and leaves us uh, relatively weakened uh, as we try to compete internationally uh, in economic markets and so forth. Racism operates at many levels. We too often think in the United States of racism as being solely limited to individual interpersonal phenomena. Uh, a, a person with negative uh, beliefs or biases or stereotypes uh, who is treating people of color in a discriminatory manner or in a poor manner simply because of their perceived uh, race or, or ethnicity. Certainly, uh, there are many examples of individually mediated racism that persist in this country, but we have to be as concerned about racism that's harder to see and is not dependent on the uh, attitudes or belief systems of individuals alone. These are forms of racism that are built into our systems and structures. Let me start with structural racism. 
What we mean by this is a system of social structures that produces cumulative, durable, race-based disadvantage. What's an example of that? Residential segregation is one of the prime examples of a structural form of racism that leads to racial inequality. Segregation um, limits the economic prospects of people of color and racializes poverty uh, in that segregation tends to concentrate poverty. Uh, and when people of color uh, live in highly segregated neighborhoods, often their children are attending poorly resourced, underfunded schools. These are often communities that are overrun with environmental health threats. These are often communities that are characterized as food deserts, uh, lacking uh, healthy food retail, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't take uh, a lot of research to see that uh, schools, school and residential segregation persists despite uh, the belief uh, that most individuals have that, uh, that segregation is a bad thing, uh, but, but segregation persists in ways that systematically disadvantage people of color. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, about um, some of the ways in which segregation persists, again, despite uh, the uh, individual attitudes uh, that we may hold. Institutional forms of racism include policies, practices, procedures of institutions that have a disproportionate and negative impact on people of color and their ability to access good services and opportunities. So examples of this include inequitable law enforcement. You've all heard of uh, stop and frisk. These are policy, aggressive policing policies that tend to be uh, applied in urban areas where there are many young men of color in particular. Uh, these practices have resulted in too many young men of color getting caught up in criminal justice systems uh, and uh, and uh, finding that the, their race uh, often leads to harsher sentencing and uh, worse outcomes in criminal justice systems compared to white defendants with similar criminal, criminal records. Again, while we may have individuals operating within these systems who have racist attitudes, uh, these policies and practices operate independently of the views of individuals within those systems. I talked about individually mediated racism, uh, individuals with rac racial bias treating people poorly or in a discriminatory manner. And of course, uh, this form of racism persists. But we also have to be concerned about internalized racism, the acceptance by marginalized racial populations of negative societal beliefs and stereotypes about themselves, which can lead to the perception of oneself as worthless and powerless. We need to be thinking about racism at least at all four of these levels and understanding how they interact over time and operate across the life cycle to produce cumulative disadvantage uh, for many people of color. These many forms of racism operate in ways that may mutually reinforce each other. As I mentioned earlier, uh, residential segregation persists. Our government uh, actually was complicit. Government at all levels was complicit in creating separate and unequal communities for people of color to live in apart from whites. But that legacy lives on even uh, for people today, uh, middle and upper middle income people of color who find themselves uh, in highly segregated uh, communities of color. Residential segregation is reliant on both institutional discrimination in the real estate and housing finance markets, such as uh, the uh, the, the fact that uh, many families of color have been sold mortgage products uh, that are inferior, uh, that were part of the uh, uh, economic crisis back in 2008, 2009. Uh, but segregation also depends on individual interpersonal discrimination in real estate and housing transactions. And unfortunately, research demonstrates that this form of discrimination persists to this day. Racism also operates in our healthcare systems in ways that may mutually reinforce each other. At least some of the healthcare quality disparities that we see in the United States are due to physician biases. And I'm gonna talk about this uh, shortly, but we know that these biases are more likely to be activated in settings characterized by time pressure, resource constraints, and cognitive complexity. In these kinds of uh, situations, physicians sometimes fall back upon biases and stereotypes to fill in missing information. The very systems characterized by time pressure, resource constraints, and cognitive complexity tend to be our under-resourced safety net institutions where a disproportionate share of people of color, patients of color are being treated. So the very systems in which pe people of color uh, are being treated can elicit, can tend to bring about 
uh, biases and stereotypes um, uh, based on the way that we structure those systems. And I wanna turn to uh, the report that uh, Michelle mentioned at the outset, Unequal Treatment, published 20 years ago by the National Academy of uh, Press. This was an Institute of Medicine report. Now, Institute of Medicine is called the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, a study committee produced this report uh, in response to a request from Congress in 1999. The question posed to the IOM was, do racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare quality persist even after we control for access related factors, such as whether or not people have insurance or money to pay for out of pocket costs. The Congress was trying to isolate the question of whether race or racism may play a role in the lower quality of health care that patients of color receive. At the time in 1999, 2000, there was considerable debate about racial disparities in health care. Were they due to uh, racism? or were they merely an artifact of socioeconomic differences between patients of color and white patients? Many argued uh, that the uh, lack of, of health insurance uh, or the lack of ability to pay for out-of-pocket care was a major factor in the disparities that were observed uh, and that race itself, the patient's race, did not play a factor at all in these disparities. So that was the question that was posed to IOM, uh, was to isolate the question of whether race or racism played a role. Unfortunately, what we found was that there was widespread evidence of uh, disparities in the quality of care uh, and literally every clinical procedure, every disease area that we looked at, uh, we found evidence that racial and ethnic disparities were prevalent and persistent. In the 20 years since then, have we made progress? Well, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or ARC, an agency of uh, the federal HHS, uh, every year produces a national healthcare disparities and quality report. Uh, it, they have found that since 2000, disparities have narrowed only on about 8% of measures for American Indian and Alaska Native populations, 2% of uh, measures for Asian American populations, 3% of measures for African Americans, 4% of measures for the Latinx population, and 10% of measures for the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander population. So despite all of the attention directed toward the unequal treatment report, despite the many recommendations that were offered in that report, we as a nation have not made significant progress toward eliminating these healthcare disparities. And unfortunately for many patients, this is a matter of life and death. The most recent ARC National Healthcare Qual uh, Quality and Disparities Report uh, released in 2021 uh, finds that, uh, uh, that for uh, patients of color overwhelmingly uh, the quality of care that they receive is the same or worse than that of white patients uh, reflecting the most recent years of data collection, 2015 to 2019. As you can see from this slide, for the American Indian and Alaska Native population, for example, only on, on about 10% of the quality measures uh, were American Indians found to have a better quality of care uh, than the white population. The remaining measures, uh, about half uh, American Indians receive about the same quality of care uh, and about 40% 40 per, 40 of the measures, uh, the quality of, of care was worse for the American Indian population relative to the white population. You see similar patterns for the Asian American, African American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and Latinx population, all of whom uh, are, uh, are experiencing healthcare quality uh, disparities at the same level or worse um, uh, uh, today. Um, looking over time, we find uh, that from 2000 to 2019 for African-Americans uh, of the 152 measures of healthcare quality, ARC found that only about half of those measures showed improvement, 45% remained unchanged and 7% were getting worse from 2000 to 2019. For the Latinx population, again, we see a very, very similar uh, pattern when we look at uh, quality measures. Of the 172 total measures of quality that ARC looked at, uh, uh, the Latinx population uh, received a better quality of care on only 34 of the measures. The remaining measures, uh, that population uh, saw their quality of care being the same or worse than that of the white population. Uh, and of course, uh, there are many examples of this for many other communities of color. What are the kinds of healthcare quality disparities that we see? Unfortunately, many of the uh, kinds of clinical procedures, 
uh, uh, tests, treatments that we documented back in 2002 in the unequal treatment report remain today. So patients of color are still less likely than whites to receive preventive care and routine medical procedures. Black patients are treated less for pain than white patients. For example, sickle cell patients uh, who are in severe pain waited longer in emergency rooms to get pain than white patients uh, with similarly painful diseases, according to one study uh, published uh, about six years ago. Black patients are still less likely than white patients to receive kidney transplants. I'm gonna uh, talk a, a more about this particular issue um, uh, shortly. Doctors are almost twice as likely to refer white patients to a specialist than they are to refer black patients uh, for specialists. And black and Latinx individuals are less likely to receive appropriate cardiac medication or to undergo cardiac bypass surgery than similarly situated uh, white patients. So these uh, examples of healthcare disparities, healthcare inequities uh, persist to this day. What are some of the factors that help to explain uh, these inequities? We know that our doctors, our nurses, uh, our, all of our healthcare professionals are highly trained. Overwhelmingly, they are dedicated to patient care. Overwhelmingly, our healthcare professionals would tell you that they are not at all racist. Many would tell you that they don't see color. I'll tell you uh, shortly why that in itself is a problem. All of us see color. It is impossible to not see color. So if you hear a physician say that they don't see color, you need to be concerned about disparities happening in their clinical practice. There are many factors that are complicit in healthcare inequities. Here are some of the factors that were identified in the unequal treatment report and, and persist to this day. One factor is separate and inequitable healthcare systems. People of color are disproportionately concentrated in lower tier, under-resourced, lower quality healthcare systems, safety net uh, institutions and other systems that struggle to provide high quality care. Why is this? Residential segregation plays one big role. Uh, we know that people of color uh, tend to, to live in communities uh, with a uh, a lower density of primary care providers, clinics, hospitals, specialists, et cetera. Uh, and those that are present in those communities sometimes struggle uh, to provide high quality care. This is what I refer to as the maldistribution of healthcare resources, because oftentimes communities of color are sicker and need more healthcare services, but the geographic distribution of healthcare resources doesn't align with the level of need Rather, too often in the United States, uh, healthcare resources are distributed according to where patient resources are located. In other words, well-off uh, communities are more likely to have the best, highest quality and densest concentration of healthcare resources in those communities. Second, uh, we don't have one healthcare system in the United States. We have many, and we have tiered health insurance and differences in provider reimbursement that are important. All of you know that there are many different forms of health insurance in the, in the United States. We have some uh, forms of health insurance that have been called Cadillac level insurance, comprehensive benefits, uh, a, 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 a substantial reimbursement for providers. Uh, these are the kinds of attributes of health insurance uh, that ensure that, uh, that patients get a higher quality of care. It's also true that there are many patients of color who are, uh, who are in systems where provider reimbursement is low. Patients who are covered by Medicaid, for example, um, Medicaid continues to struggle to provide the level of reimbursement necessary to attract providers to provide these services uh, to patients. Uh, one interesting natural experiment uh, that um, journalists may want to turn to uh, is to look to see if there is evidence of differences in the quality of care that was provided for Medicaid patients shortly after passage of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. The ACA mandated that Medicaid reimbursement be equivalent to that of Medicare for a year after passage of the law. Uh, and I would love to see some research uh, into whether that, uh, that increase in reimbursement for Medicaid payment uh, made a difference in the quality of care for those patients. Third, we know that clinician biases, stereotypes, and prejudices can sneak into the clinical encounter and infect the encounter in ways that may disadvantage patients of color. I'm gonna talk about that shortly. Third, race-related clinical decision supports 
and algorithms can sometimes inadvertently hurt patients of color and direct more resources uh, to white patients in ways that are unfair and are unjustified uh, because race is not a biological or genetic construct. I'm gonna say more about this shortly. And then we have a persistent lack of diversity among healthcare professionals, uh, which constrains patient choice. I'm gonna talk about that as well. These are just some of the factors that are associated with the longstanding healthcare inequities in this country. So let's begin to tackle some of these. Let's start with a question of separate and unequal uh, healthcare, what some have called medical apartheid. A number of studies document the disproportionate concentration of patients of color, particularly African-Americans, in uh, uh, healthcare systems that are poorly resourced and that struggle with patient quality. One uh, such study uh, produced by my colleague at uh, the Urban uh, Institute, Anush uh, Gengopadaya, uh, in 2021 found uh, that there were significant differences between black and white patients in patient safety measures. Uh, Anush gathered records, uh, discharge records from 27 states and found that black patients experienced higher rates of adverse safety events on 55% of patient safety measures. And for over 80% of the patient safety measures, black patients were significantly less likely to be admitted into hospitals classified as high quality hospitals. These are hospitals uh, where patient safety risks are minimized based on, the, uh, on uh, existing patient safety indicators. Uh, Anuj and his, time, uh, his research team also found within setting differences. So what I've just referred to in, are, are between health system differences in the quality of care that, that patients receive. Uh, but we, we also have evidence of within system differences. So Anuj and his team found that black patients experience higher rates of hospital acquired illnesses or injuries related to surgical procedures relative to white patients treated in the same hospital for the same conditions. These within hospital differences um, in adverse patient safety rates remained even when comparing black and white patients with similar forms of health insurance. So again, this isolates patient race as a factor uh, in, the, uh, in the quality gap. As I mentioned earlier, we have tiered health insurance. There are some forms of health insurance that are very comprehensive, providing a comprehensive benefit, providing uh, a reimbursement that is adequate to uh, the services provided, but people of color remain disproportionately un and underinsured despite the Affordable Care Act. Unequal treatment, uh, the unequal treatment report noted uh, 20 years ago that medical care financing arrangements should discourage fragmentation of healthcare provision into separate tiers of providers who adhere to different standards of care and disproportionately serve separate racial and ethnic minority segments of American society. Medicaid and other government programs that mandate enrollment of beneficiaries in managed care should be prepared to pay plans at rates that give Medicaid enrollees access to the same health plan products serving substantial portions of privately insured patients. This observation from unequal treatment 20 years ago remains today. Let's talk about the question of racial bias and whether healthcare providers have biases or prejudices that may infect the clinical encounter. First, let me just give a little bit of background so that we all understand. Research, uh, decades of research in social and cognitive psychology finds that we humans are, are cognitive misers. We limit the cognitive effort that we expend uh, while maximizing our presumed understanding of the world by relying on mental shortcuts. Social categorization makes people feel like we understand the world because, because once we categorize a person into a group, we think we can predict that person's likes, behavior, proclivities, et cetera. In the United States, a person's race is an especially powerful determinant of how we socially categorize others and consequently how we perceive those in our in-group or those of an out-group. This is because race has been one of the most socially significant ways to classify people in the United States throughout U uh, US history. Race is among the most salient of our personal characteristics that we bring into every encounter. It's also true that implicit attitudes and beliefs are automatically and very quickly activated when people are exposed to difference, when they're exposed to people of a different racial group, uh, gender group, ethnic group, um, 
for which they have already developed a bias. Many of you are familiar with the literature on implicit biases and implicit attitudes. Uh, again, psychology has uh, contributed an enormous amount to this understanding uh, of how our brains work. Implicit attitudes and stereotypes represent feelings and thoughts about a target group that are a part of a person's culture. And as people become socialized into their culture, these feelings and beliefs become so ingrained that they automatically produce associations between a specific target and the characteristics associated with them. Stereotypes of this nature are so well learned that we are often unaware that we're making them. Uh, I invite those of you who are less familiar with the implicit association test to go ahead and take 15 minutes and take the test online. If you Google implicit association test uh, and go to the Project Implicit website, you can actually take uh, the implicit association test and you can uh, determine your level of unconscious bias, uh, not just based on race, but based on other factors such as perceived religion, uh, gender, body size, age, these are all among the dimensions that we tend to have uh, broad societal stereotypes and biases against, uh, and which we are often uh, aware of, even if we don't consciously endorse or believe uh, in those biases. There's persistent evidence that healthcare providers are just like the rest of us. A systemic review of 15 studies measuring implicit bias uh, confirmed that healthcare professionals hold the same level of implicit bias against Black, Latinx, and dark-skinned people as the general population, and that implicit bias is significantly related to patient-provider interactions, treatment decisions, treatment adherence, and patient health outcomes. Some of the measures, uh, some of the data gathered uh, on the implicit association test show that somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of the general population harbors at least a mild pro-white bias. This is because of how we've been socialized here in the United States, where white is viewed as normative or desirable uh, or the standard. When we think of a, a generic um, American, many of us often think of a white person. Uh, so we have normalized uh, whiteness and we have otherized uh, people of color in terms of our broad societal narratives. So even if you as an individual find those beliefs abhorrent, no doubt you are aware of those uh, broad societal beliefs, um, and, and uh, you may even find uh, that those uh, uh, belief systems infect your thinking in ways that you're not consciously aware of. Another study found uh, a, syst a systematic review of 37 studies confirmed uh, the substantial evidence of pro-white or light-skinned, anti-Black, uh, Hispanic, American Indian, or dark-skinned bias among a variety of healthcare professionals uh, across multiple levels of training and discipline. So it doesn't matter if you are new to the field or if you've been in the field for decades. Uh, again, if you've been socialized in the United States, more than likely uh, you harbor attitudes and biases that you may consciously reject, but nonetheless affect your thinking and behavior. We know that physician biases are associated with poor treatment. Over 70% of white medical students in a recent study believe that there are biological differences in pain perception between blacks and whites, which may contribute to some of the disparities in terms of uh, provision of pain medication to African-Americans uh, relative to white patients. And we know from a study uh, conducted in, in 2007, Alex Green and his colleagues, that physicians' implicit biases contributed to racial and ethnic disparities in the use of medical procedures such as thrombolysis for myocardial infarction. Uh, this study also showed that as physicians' implicit bias scores increased, their likelihood of treating black patients with thrombolysis decreased. So this was one of the first studies providing clear evidence that these biases may affect the clinical de uh, 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 decisions made by uh, providers. We also know that, that um, there's bias in, in electronic health records. Uh, a study published just a few weeks ago found uh, in a sample of over 40,000 uh, his, history and physical notes from uh, nearly 20,000 patients uh, that there are many uh, notes containing negative descriptors. Uh, for example, uh, stating that a patient is resistant or non-compliant. Um, these investigators sought to determine the odds of finding at least one negative descriptor uh, based on the race or ethnicity of the patient but after controlling for patient demographic uh, factors and health characteristics. So in other words, uh, they were 
uh, controlling for differences in patient education uh, and presenting concerns and found that compared to white patients, black patients were over two and a half times more likely to have a negative descriptor in their history and physical notes. Words like refused or not adherent, not compliant, agitated. These investigators write, quote, our findings raise concerns about stigmatizing language in the electronic health record and its potential to exacerbate racial and ethnic healthcare disparities, end quote. There's also recent evidence that physician and patient racial concordance um, can make a difference, particularly for African-American patients. Uh, Greenwood and colleagues uh, address the question, are black patient outcomes better when treated by black physicians? This has been a research question uh, that has been difficult to address in the past, owing to the relative lack of African-American physicians treating black patients. Uh, what Greenwood and Al all found uh, in looking at 1.8 hospital births in the state of Florida between 1992 and 2015, that when black uh, babies were delivered by black uh, physicians, that their mortality rates were halved as compared to when those uh, black infants were delivered by a non-African-American uh, physician. Uh, and these benefits tended to increase during more challenging births and in hospitals that deliver more babies. More research is needed to unpack this. But for me, what this study suggests is that we need to better understand what African-American physicians are doing and thinking as they interact with their patients. Are they showing more empathy, more warmth? Do they have a greater level of concern for these patients that may help uh, to result in these improved uh, birth outcomes for African-American infants? Then there's the issue of clinical decision supports and the misuse of race in the clinical encounter. Most of you know by now that uh, race is in fact a social construct. There is no biological or genetic basis to the racial designations uh, that we use here in the United States. So clinical decision support tools or, or CDSTs certainly have been helpful uh, in addressing uh, racial health disparities and advancing health equity, but only if they help physicians to provide the gold standard of care for every patient and not based on presumed racial differences. So CDSTs have the potential to advance equity, uh, but the reality is that the methods and assumptions used uh, in the algorithms, al algorithms at the core of CDS, uh, CDSTs may themselves import biases that are detrimental to patients of color. Uh, an article in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2020 stated that many of these race-adjusted algorithms guide decisions in ways that may direct more attention or resources to white patients than to members of racial and ethnic minorities. So while the use of race in clinical al algorithms is largely di driven by differences in health outcomes uh, that we see in large data sets, these difference are, differences are most likely due to the effects of racism and other determinants of health, not biological effects of one race versus another. As the sociologist Troy Duster has said, uh, the relationship between race and health is biological in effect, not origin. In other words, it's the lived experience of race uh, and racism that may lead to biological and, and physiological differences that show up in the clinical encounter uh, for African-Americans. And indeed now there's growing evidence of epigenetic effects. In other words, genetic changes that occur as a result of uh, social and economic forces, particularly racism, that may erode the health of people of color, not only across the lifespan, but across generations in the form of epigenetic effects. Let me give you an example of a clinical decision um, uh, of an algorithm that, that unfairly disadvantages people of color. When we're talking about uh, kidney disease, often uh, physicians will measure the level of creatinine in the blood uh, through the glomerular filtration rate or GFR. Uh, physicians have found over the years that African-Americans have higher levels of creatinine, uh, uh, which is supposedly a byproduct of larger muscle mass. Uh, but no one has investigated the question of whether muscle mass is related to the higher levels of creatinine uh, in African-Americans. So this assumption was made uh, and a one 
uh, clinical decision tool suggest having a higher standard for African Americans with respect to creatinine levels uh, for determination of whether these patients should be on a kidney transplant plant list. In effect, uh, African American patients have to be sicker than white patients to get on a kidney transplant list with this kind of race-based algorithm. And again, there's no biological or genetic reason uh, that that algorithm should make a different standard for African Americans relative to white patients who have kidney disease. Before talking about some solutions, I wanna make the point again that healthcare inequities hurt all Americans. Everyone in the US pays some portion of the high cost of treatments uh, uh, for the excess burden of poor health among people of color that could have been prevented if their social, economic, and environmental causes had been addressed earlier, or if there were ways to intervene earlier to prevent the progression of illness uh, that these, these patients should receive. The expense of treating more advanced illness is invariably greater than treating illnesses that are identified uh, in uh, or treated in earlier stages. And this financial burden is shared by all of us uh, in things like higher costs of, of health insurance. And we all suffer the consequences of lost productivity because of the inability of a large segment of the population uh, to be their healthiest and to be the, the most productive workers they can be. Now, having made that argument, um, let me emphasize that the most important argument in my view is a moral one, that we as a society have a moral imperative uh, to ensure that healthcare is equitable and just for every patient according to patient need, and that widespread disparities should not exist, and in fact are antithetical uh, to our beliefs as a nation in terms of uh, our egalitarian ideals. Let me now turn to some potential intervention strategies. Many of these uh, interventions that I wanna elevate uh, were first surfaced in the IOM Unequal Treatment Report, but as I mentioned, they've not been acted upon. And more recently, we have evidence that other interventions can begin to work as well. So I'm very proud uh, to, to um, let you know that uh, a, at Cambridge University Press, we'll be publishing a book that I and my colleagues, uh, Drs. Lou Pinner, uh, John DeVidio, and now Hajiwara, uh, are, that we are co-authoring called Unequal Health, Anti-Black Racism and the Threat to a, a American Health. Uh, we hope that this will be uh, coming out later this year. Uh, this, the interventions that we talk about can be organized uh, based on uh, some of the definitions of racism that I offered earlier. Some of our interventions focus on promoting structural equity by promoting, for example, universal coverage with comprehensive benefits and equitable reimbursement. This would address the maldistribution of healthcare resources and some medical segregation, but will not by itself eliminate inequities uh, in the quality of care. That's because we have other factors like biases uh, and <laughs> inappropriate racial decision supports uh, that may perpetuate inequity. So having universal coverage with comprehensive benefits and equitable, equitable reimbursement will go a long way toward ensuring that all patients have the same access uh, to high quality health care. We need to be promoting institutional equity providing resources for hospitals and health systems according to need and not inadvertently disadvantaging those health systems that are under-resourced. So some of our pay for performance models, for example, would effectively punish uh, under-resourced healthcare systems because they struggle to provide the kinds of patient outcomes that are uh, rewarded uh, under many pay for performance schemes. Uh, and so we need to ensure that all health systems and uh, local health departments uh, and government agencies that can produce healthier populations have the resources necessary to ensure uh, that we can uh, provide the kinds of patient outcomes uh, that, uh, that we desire. It's also true that institutions should publicly report healthcare quality and access uh, measures by patient demographic factors. In my view, uh, reporting on healthcare quality and access by patient race ethnicity, primary language, and ability status, in addition to uh, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, and many other factors will be important for accountability to ensure that the public knows where disparities are occurring and allowing patients to the extent that they have a choice to be able to vote with their feet uh, and seek care in health systems 
that have less evidence of disparity or inequity. We need to be focused on clinical equity, focusing on the, stopping the inappropriate use of patient race in medical diagnosis and treatments, and uh, ensuring that we better know how to address race and difference in the clinical encounter. And finally, we need educational equity. We need to ensure that the share of black and other people of color physicians uh, reflects the demographics of the American population. We're a long way uh, from being there, but we need to ensure that more people of color can come into health professions careers if they so desire to expand patient choice uh, and ensure uh, that our workforce looks more like the American population. So um, let me start with clinical equity, addressing race and difference in the clinical encounter. The American Medical Association is doing um, uh, quite a bit of work uh, to address and, and, and advance racial justice and health equity. Uh, here I need to congratulate my friend, uh, Dr. Aletha Maybank, uh, who directs the Center on Health Equity at the American Medical Association. Uh, AMA calls for eliminating all forms of discrimination, occlusion, exclusion and oppression in medical and, phys uh, and physician education uh, and by mandating anti-racism training, structural competency, and equity explicit training and competencies for all trainees and staff, and to publicly report equity assessments for medical schools and hospitals. Now it needs to be said uh, that for decades, uh, many medical schools, nursing schools, dental schools have been offering uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion training to staff, to faculty, to students. And in some cases, uh, we are not seeing uh, a significant improvement uh, in terms of the ability of trainees uh, to be able to address the needs of, 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 uh, of diverse uh, patients. What that suggests is that we need to ensure that DEI training is not a one-shot um, or a few um, instance opportunity for training. It, it is a lifelong learning skill that we need to reinforce for all healthcare providers. They need to be deeply invested in learning over the course of their careers and continuing their training so that they remain fresh and on top of new concepts uh, and topics. Uh, so this means that we've got to consistently um, ensure that training opportunities are available and to ensure uh, that people seriously embrace opportunities for training and lifelong learning. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it remains true that uh, people of color are underrepresented among US physicians. Uh, these data from the ARC National Healthcare Quality and Disparities Report shows the distribution of all active physicians on the circle on the left relative to the US population overall on the right. Uh, and as you can see, for African Americans in particular, uh, who are represented uh, by the white shade, only about 5% of US physicians identify as African American, whereas about 12% of the US population is African American. Uh, again, we need to ensure that we expand diversity, not so that we can match every patient one-to-one -one in terms of their, um, their racial preference with, a, a, uh, with their physician. Uh, that remains a tall order. But what I'm suggesting is that increasing diversity among our healthcare workforce can increase the capacity of US healthcare systems overall to better address the needs of a growing and diverse U.S. population. Finally, I want to turn to the issue of the pipeline. How do we ensure that we get more uh, uh, talented students of color into health professions careers? One of the reports I had the honor of working on at the Institute of Medicine uh, before leaving there for other positions uh, is this report called In the Nation's Compelling Interest ensuring diversity in the healthcare workforce. This report was focused on what can our health professions, educational institutions and their accrediting bodies do uh, to ensure that we are uh, matriculating and graduating more providers of color who are well prepared to serve our nation's population. In other words, not so much on what students themselves need to do, uh, but rather, what can our nation's health professions graduate training institutions do, our medical schools, nursing schools, dental schools, et cetera. This report offered a number of recommendations, including changes to the health professions education admissions process, calling for a whole file review and de-emphasizing standardized tests, which have, uh, which have little predictive ability uh, when, when clinicians are out in the field and practicing once they're 
uh, graduate training days are over. Uh, but yet these tests and their over-reliance on test scores uh, can disproportionately and negatively affect uh, the ability of uh, students of color to, to matriculate into health professions programs. This report also called for these schools to attend to the institutional racial climate, uh, examining whether students, faculty, staff uh, feel safe and supportive, particularly if they are members of uh, populations of color. The report called for including diversity efforts in our accreditation standards. Uh, we know that if we want to change things in graduate medical education or dental education or nursing education, we've got to change the standards uh, that these programs are focused on. Uh, and once we set the bar higher in terms of their uh, engagement around diversity efforts, uh, then we should be able to see uh, an expansion of diversity in these institutions. And we also need to reduce financial barriers for students seeking to work in underserved communities, particularly by doing things like expanding funding for the US public health service uh, programs, uh, which have done a great job of ensuring that healthcare providers are, are situated in underserved communities uh, through things like a loan uh, forgiveness and loan repayment. Uh, in other words, when uh, students in medical schools or nursing schools or dental schools uh, can get their, uh, the cost of their education address uh, with a service commitment, serving a minimum number of years in uh, an underserved community, such as an Indian reservation, uh, that this has done a, a very effective job in not only diversifying uh, the US healthcare workforce, but also ensuring that those workers are where we need them. Finally, uh, this was not a recommendation in the nation's compelling interest report, but it's my own recommendation. It's this last bullet promote educational equity. I really believe that school and residential segregation are at the root causes uh, behind the educational achievement gap between students of color, particularly African-American, Latinx, American Indian students uh, and white students and other more advantaged students. We know that in highly segregated communities of color, uh, kids are often going to schools that are under-resourced, uh, that have uh, fewer advanced placement courses, uh, fewer up-to-date textbooks, fewer teachers credentialed to teach the subjects that they're teaching. These are some of the structural inequities that we've got to fix, a structural form of racism that we need to address by acknowledging that separate and unequal schools are just that, separate and unequal. I'm going to uh, conclude this talk uh, by leaving you with a quote from Dr. Mary Bassett, formerly director of the, the Department of Health in New York City, now director of health for the state of New York. Dr. Bassett wrote a few years ago that anti-racism is a collective healing without which our nation will remain painfully and inequitably divided, corroding opportunity, spirits, and bodies alike. I think Dr. Bassett nailed it uh, in her description of the toll of racism and the need for anti-racism to now guide our efforts going forward. I'll stop there. I hope we have time for some comments and questions. And again, thank you, Michelle, for having me. Uh, and thank you for this excellent work of this program. Brian, this has been such a inspiring and illuminating talk. Thank you so much for, it's really just so sweeping, everything that you have covered. I wanna just wanna remind people that you can put questions in the Q&A panel. We'll do our best to get through as many of them as we can. And Brian, if I could just start out with one, you know, in a way it might be hard to, for some reporters to think, you know, where can I find a foothold to start? Like this is all so complex. So if you were a reporter in a local market, are there certain things that you suggest people look at to help try to unlock these questions in their own communities and own hospitals and health systems? Oh, absolutely. And that's, that's a great question. There are a lot of things that we can do. And one of the most important is to raise awareness, of course, that these disparities persist. So as, as I mentioned earlier, one of the challenges that we have is that there are many hospitals and health systems that are collecting data on fairly standard patient access and quality measures, right? So were patients able to get needed care in a timely fashion? Were patients satisfied with the care that they received? Did patients receive uh, the evidence-based gold standards of care for whatever particular presenting concern that they had. But we don't publish these data and make them available, disaggregated by patient race or ethnicity. Journalists could potentially FOIA some of this information uh, and 
write articles talking about a local hospital or health system that may show evidence of inequities. That complemented by the voices and experiences of, of patients of color would be powerfully illuminating and would certainly spur action because if we don't measure what we're trying to fix, it won't get changed. So um, I, I'm really excited about the potential and the role that journalists have played in the past in uh, accessing data that the public can't easily access, publishing this information and raising awareness about inequities because um, that in my view is the one thing that will go the furthest to promote accountability. And Brian, um, kind of perfect segue from, from your comment uh, Kylan Jackson, who, by the way, is a fellow in, in our data fellowship, asks, what group or organization that you know about is leading the charge in requiring public reporting of healthcare quality and access by patients race? Well, I think the federal government certainly should, um, but we are still a ways away from that. But there are two states that I'm aware of that are publicly reporting um, uh, access and quality information by patient race, uh, ethnicity, primary language, and some collect other important demographic information as well. So Minnesota um, has, a, um, uh, has an effort underway and a website that allows patients to go on that website and get the quality data uh, for their local hospital or clinic or, or health system. And recently Connecticut has also passed legislation uh, to do the same. The federal government has a website that used to be called Hospital Compare. Now it's called Care Compare. I believe it's carecompare.gov. This allows anybody um, to get information on quality measures for hospitals around the country. But yet this website does not disaggregate uh, this information by patient race or ethnicity. Uh, and if they would do that, again, I believe that we would go a long way toward both raising awareness, uh, ensuring that um, that patients are and, and consumers are activated and promoting accountability. Thank you. And um, we have a, a question from um, from Bradley Craig, who says, "Have the studies and analyses of disparities in quality also been stratified by non-racial categories such as income and asset level, education? Are these pronounced disparities for?" Uh, BIPOC populations also pronounced for lower socioeconomic classes, irrespective of race. Yes, uh, we do know, thanks to the ARC uh, National Healthcare Quality and Disparities Report, that there are disparities on the basis of educational attainment and income. Uh, and so, um, again, we have to ask the question: Do these disparities persist even after we control for differences in things like insurance status? Uh, so. Uh, that body of research exists. We know that, that there are people in rural communities that struggle uh, to access appropriate high quality health care. We know that there are low income whites who struggle to access appropriate health care. It's difficult to make a comparison uh, between the level of inequity experienced by say low income whites relative to patients of color. Uh, but the, the point is uh, that there are many Americans, um, uh, white, uh, people of color and and, and all patients who are falling below the standard of care that should be provided based on our evidence-based uh, guidelines. So inequities uh, and uh, insufficient quality is, is widespread, but it's difficult to make a one-to-one -one comparison. We know these disparities exist based on geography, income, and educational attainment as well. We have a question from Louise Square. And uh, I'm going to take my moderator privilege to add another element to it based on something else that you said. She says, is there a push to address or correct the algorithms that perpetuate health inequities? And, and I would just expand that by saying, also, what about these things like, it's, you know, this, this idea that you, you pointed out that it's harder to get on the transplant list. Um, like, are those sorts of things also being addressed? Those sorts of, of, of metrics that are very problematic. Absolutely, it's been encouraging to see that this is a, um, a conversation in health policy and research circles. The American Medical Association is leading an effort uh, to identify uh, and root out inappropriate 
uh, algorithms that inappropriately use patient race in ways that may disadvantage patients of color. Many other groups, the American Kidney Foundation, others are also revisiting these clinical standards uh, and guidelines. Uh, the, the, the question for clinicians is, um, if you are noting the patient's race, what are your assumptions based on? If you're making assumptions based on a belief in some inherent genetic or biological difference, you are likely doing a disservice to patients of color. Uh, if you are doing it based on other factors, such as the fact that many patients of color uh, face uh, social, economic, and environmental uh, factors that may constrain their health, that is an appropriate use of, of patient race. But yes, thankfully, there are efforts underway uh, to ensure that clinical decision supports uh, are based on the best available evidence and not assumptions about patients based on race. We have a very interesting question from Brianna Reeves. She says she's from Black Voice News in Riverside, California. And her question is, what role has COVID-19 the COVID-19 pandemic played in bringing unequal health systems to the forefront? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, COVID has really laid these inequities bare, right? Um, we know that pe uh, people of color have been disproportionately hit with COVID higher infection rates, worse outcomes in many cases. Uh, what I would love to see is more reporting on why this occurs, because I've seen a lot of reporting early in the COVID pandemic that said, you know, people of color, uh, particularly Latinx, uh, African American and American Indian populations um, have higher infection rates. They're much more likely to be hospitalized. They're more likely to have serious illness. They're more likely to die. Explain why that is. Uh, and that is because of social, economic, and environmental factors that too often produce illness in communities of color, not because of some inherent uh, difference or vulnerability in these populations of color. Uh, so yes, COVID has, has really laid that bare. Uh, I, I believe there is some recent research on inequities between healthcare systems in terms of how patients are treated. But as my colleague Anush Ganapadaya uh, has found, um, there are within uh, system inequities as well. And so uh, those are difficult to blame on any other factor than the patient race and the racism in the clinical encounter. We have a question from Usha McFarlane who wrote the piece for STAT that you just highlighted and that we shared in the chat. She, would, she said, I would love to know Dr. Smedley's thoughts on going forward and how helpful he is that we may finally see widespread improvements. We've seen so many efforts in the past fall to the wayside. Oh, that's such a great question, Usha. Um, you know, um, I have been more optimistic at uh, various times. <laughs> uh, in recent years, I was uh, very optimistic after the Affordable Care Act passed because there were a number of provisions in the Affordable Care Act that specifically attempted to tackle inequities. Uh, and then we've seen the erosion of that law in recent years uh, which frankly le led me to be quite pessimistic. Um, but I do believe uh, that we're making progress. Uh, and I do believe that over the long haul, we are going to um, ensure that we are providing the highest quality of care for, for all patients. And that's because the, the toll of health inequities is too significant. Uh, it is too damaging to our nation. And I believe that our nation's leaders across the political spectrum uh, want to address these inequities uh, because they ultimately drag down our economy, drag down our productivity. And again, as a moral issue, they are simply unacceptable. So I am hopeful um, that people of goodwill, again, across the polit political spectrum, uh, will uh, rise to the occasion. And this is a moment uh, when, when leaders need to rise to the occasion. We have a question from Talis Shelbourne, who is actually working on a project on, on, on these issues related to asthma. And she asks, how do you prove inequities due to environmental racism when that healthcare data isn't available? In other words, there's no testing of blood levels, but blood lead levels in areas near lead exposure or air pollution data isn't available in neighborhoods located near highways. Oh, well, that's a great question. And yes, there is a challenge in terms of making that di direct link <clears throat> in specific communities, specific instances. However, there's a large body of research showing that people of color are exposed to environmental health risks 
at rates that are much higher than uh, white Americans. And again, a lot of it is because of geography. A lot of it is, is because of structural forms of racism, such as residential segregation. Uh, a lot of it is because polluting industries have found that it is easier to cite their, uh, to, to locate themselves in or near communities of color because they find less political resistance uh, and um, uh, it, it's, it's often difficult to ensure that communities of color are not uh, violated by these kinds of, of polluting industries. One researcher who's done some amazing work in this space is uh, Rachel Morell Frosch uh, at the University of California uh, at Berkeley. Uh, she has found that yes, indeed, controlling for other factors, uh, communities of color are disproportionately exposed to uh, 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 air, uh, air particulates, environmental uh, and air uh, exposures, environmental degradation and waste. All of us know about the story of Flint, Michigan, uh, where kids of color were disproportionately exposed to uh, lead tainted drinking water. Um, this, is, this is an issue of, this is an example of a structural form of racism uh, right before us in that uh, the people of Flint didn't make the decision to switch that water supply. Uh, rather, uh, uh, the state, state government made that decision uh, in ways that mm, probably wouldn't have if it were a whiter, wealthier community. Um, so uh, yes, in, in specific instances, it may be difficult to make the connection between specific exposures and outcomes for a particular population. But overall, the research is very clear uh, that uh, communities of color uh, face uh, many sources of environmental degradation that in fact are harmful to health. And Brian, we'll close with a question from Chrisanna Mink. She says, I couldn't agree more about educational inequities, starting with early childhood education. How can journalists report that quality preschool and primary ed education can matter for healthcare? Oh, wow, I love that question. So, you know, here's, here's another um, uh, interesting topic, early childhood education. You know, we actually have some very elegant longitudinal studies, randomized controlled trials, where children, young children were assigned to enriched early educational environments when they were three years old, four years old. Um, and researchers have followed them into adulthood, finding that in many cases as adults, these people, the children exposed to the intervention had better educational attainment, better occupational outcomes, less involvement in criminal justice systems, uh, less uh, reliance on uh, uh, a public assistance. Um, and these are studies that follow these young children 30 years into the future. This was true in the A.B. Sedarian project in North Carolina. Uh, it was true in uh, some of the early studies of Head Start in, in Michigan. These studies uh, were started in the 60s and 70s. So we know the outcomes for kids that were exposed to the, that enriched educational inter intervention early on fared so much better than a control group of children who were matched to the experimental group. So again, that literature is out there. What would be interesting would be to perhaps interview some of those adults who, who had enriched early childhood educational experiences. No doubt, most of them don't remember those early educational experiences, but something about it accelerated them on a path to success. Uh, relative to their peers in a control group. So it would be fascinating to learn more about the personal stories, the histories of individuals who, be, who benefited from enriched early childhood education. And then we got to tackle the, the lack of political will to expand uh, evidence-based enriched early childhood education to all kids who need it. Um, I'm convinced that the kind of reporting that, um, that, that you all have been doing can help lead to building that political will. Brian, this has been a really wonderful um, and wide ranging conversation. I wanna thank you so much for your time and for your ideas. We, we're um, so delighted and honored to have had you here. And uh, we'll be sending everybody a quick survey about this webinar and your ideas for others. So please take a moment to fill that out. We'll be offering, I know a number of you have asked about the slides and Brian, I'm hoping you could send those to us and then we can offer those to everybody on our website a little later today. And we'll also have the archive recording of this webinar. And should you wanna uh, support this kind of webinar and programming, here's the information on how to do so. Uh, we hope you'll join our community of supporters. And um, 
Thank you so much to our audience for their wonderful questions and to Brian for his inspiring talk and uh, have a wonderful day.